London, and the state opening of Parliament, the occasion on which the people see their queen in her most royal estate. And Balmoral in Scotland, where a young mother spends precious summer days with her family. Two pictures of the same woman, which tell in part something of the mysterious bonds that unite a queen with her people. Bonds of love and pride, which had their beginning in her childhood, long before she dreamt of being queen. When her father came unexpectedly to the throne, her long training began. Through her girlhood, she was schooled for her great destiny, a schooling which both brought her closely into contact with people and set her apart, taught her to mingle, yet to detach herself and take the helm. This was wartime, but there were days of leisure, as well as days of duty. Here, Princess Elizabeth takes the salute of a march past of the Women's Land Army. She joined one of the women's services, and the king was proud and sometimes amused to see that his daughter could maintain an army lorry. Eventually, the war ended, and a modest, self-effacing girl comes out onto the balcony to pay tribute with the rest of her family and the nation to Prime Minister Winston Churchill. And to those who died in the war. After the war, there was a trip to South Africa, and for the princess, an opportunity to enjoy the voyage and the deck games like any other girl. In South Africa, she reached her 21st birthday, and it was here she made her now famous dedication. I declare before you all that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service and to the service of our great imperial family to which we all belong. But I shall not have strength to carry out this resolution alone unless you join in it with me, as I now invite you to do. Before the South African visit, the princess had been a bridesmaid at Lady Patricia Mountbatten's wedding. And here was another Mountbatten, Prince Philip. When the royal family returned from South Africa, the two young people had made up their minds. The king gladly gave his consent and in July 1947, they became engaged. The princess's obvious happiness brings a mood of rejoicing. Culminating in her wedding day, a day when the whole nation feels strongly their ties with the princess and her family, a day in which Everyone feels they have a share. For a few weeks, they have a quiet country honeymoon, a chance to go for walks and look at wedding pictures. And then they go to Paris, and Paris acclaims her. A princess at once warm and dignified, life-size and symbolic. These same qualities endeared her to the Canadians too. There was much for the princess to see, chuck wagon racing. 
and Red Indians in their splendid traditional costumes. But in the midst of all the excitement and her pleasure at the warm welcome, there was always the memory of the baby boy she'd had to leave at home in London. Her first baby, Prince Charles, one day to be king. Like his mother, this baby will never know what the word choice means. Destiny has already mapped his life. At this happy moment, the princess is a mother like any other mother. But more and more, her father's illness was making it necessary for her to bear a sovereign's responsibilities. In 1951, she took the king's place at the ceremony of trooping the colour. In 1952, there came the personal tragedy of her father's death. The whole nation shared her sorrow, for King George VI was dearly loved. Now, Elizabeth is queen. At her coronation, her husband, Prince Philip, kisses her cheek and swears allegiance, mitigating something of the loneliness of being queen. Her son and heir, Prince Charles, was brought specially at the Queen's request for that part of the ceremony when she was crowned. Mother and now monarch. People in the Commonwealth wanted to see her and she went to Australia. Then on to New Zealand. A Maori chief danced for her and she herself was made a chief. She went to Ceylon, and they made her welcome there too. Serene and dignified, all who saw her were aware of that intangible quality which marks a sovereign. A quality brought out by the splendid isolation, even in a crowd, which only a monarch knows. Nigeria, and cheers for the Queen re-echo up and down Africa. <laughs> but it's not only the Commonwealth that wants to see her. ...to the prosperity of la France et des peuples qui lui sont associés. Puissent la confiance et la compréhension mutuelle entre la République française et le Royaume-Uni durer toujours. Paris, which had known her as a young and newly married princess, saw her now a queen, poised and assured, but with the same warmth which had first endeared her to them. But people come to see her too. The king and queen of Thailand came. She welcomed them as she has welcomed other overseas visitors on behalf of the British people. In an open coach with a sovereign's escort, they drove together through the streets of London. But life for the monarch is not all pageantry. Another day sees her visiting a coal mine. And it's on this kind of visit that the queen comes close to her people and has the chance to understand something of their lives. And the invisible bonds are strengthened again. Today she visits a coal mine. Tomorrow she launches a ship. ship Empress of Britain. May God speed her and all who sail in her. Ooh. 
The next day, she opens a power station. This was the world's first atomic power station. Although the Queen's life is full of such occasions, she makes each one a special occasion for those who meet her. On another day, she inaugurates a new telephone system. The Lord Provost of Edinburgh speaking. This is the Queen speaking from Bristol. Good afternoon, Lord Provost. Good afternoon, Your Majesty. May I, with humble duty, offer you the loyal greetings of the citizens of Edinburgh? Thank you. And would you, Lord Provost, please convey my greetings to them? I'm always interested in any development which brings my people closer together. In a few moments, Bristol subscribers will be able to make trunk calls by merely dialing the right number up to a distance of some 300 miles. In time, the whole United Kingdom will enjoy the advantages of this new service which the post office has introduced. May I express my gratitude to your majesty for the honor which you have done to me and to Scotland in making the first call in this new service to me. Thank you. Goodbye, Lord Provost. Goodbye, your majesty. The Queen takes a keen interest in modern housing and likes to see for herself how her people are enjoying their new homes. So she comes to tea. And in the summer, people go to tea with the Queen. A garden party at Buckingham Palace is unforgettable and people from all walks of life and many different countries are invited to be her guests. The Queen enjoys many forms of sport, whether it's watching her husband play polo or a rugby football match. Most of all, she enjoys horse racing. Often she has a horse of her own among the runners. For the Queen, the procession to open Parliament is the prelude to the most historic of all her duties. When the great doors open, the Queen will make her way to the throne to deliver the speech that begins the business of Parliament for the next year. Her husband is with her at the start. Then, as her own high circumstances require, he leaves her to make her way alone to the Sovereign's place. Alone, but sustained by the love of her family and of her people. 